Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome to the Next Level, Conversations That Propel Business. This is your host, Bob Gibbons. And I'm Stephen Nooner, and I'm excited. I get to in introduce a friend of mine today, uh, a friend of mine from EO, Randy Haran. I get it right this time? Haran. Haran. Dadgummit. <laughs> <laughs> Some friend I Real am. Real close friend. Hey, yeah, there. So close. <laughs> Let me just tell you, uh, I asked Randy to come in for a couple reasons. One, uh, he has a really amazing story. He uh, built a really successful company called Texas Air Composites. Correct. And uh, they had um, just just an amazing story. Alana, I want him to share it. Um, and both EO uh, was a big part of it, but also what's really fascinating me is uh, his open uh, book kind of style of management, which mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are afraid to dive into sometimes. So I just thought there'd be a, a great opportunity to have a great person on, have a great conversation. So uh, he does have a company uh, in, uh, that he's currently involved with, kind of paying it forward and helping other companies. It's Penny Strategies, and you can find them at pennystrategies.com. Welcome, Randy. Thank you, Steve. So excited you're here. Well, we always start off with what we call wisdom of others. Okay. And this is uh, you know a quote from somebody smarter than me and Stephen. And today our quote comes from John Wooden, and he said, failure is not fatal, but failure to change might be. What do you think of that, Stephen? I think it's much better than the other three you tried before that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that, though, because, you know, what's, what's that other quote about? You know, the only thing that's guaranteed is change. Yeah. Uh, change is always going to happen, so you're going to have to adapt to that, or, or you could be fatal. I mean, look at people that have been in industries that no longer exist because technology has put them out of business. Th think of the people that are right now in industries that won't exist in five years and they have their head in the sand and they don't even know it i mean even my industry i'm in commercial real estate but you know the internet is significantly changing the way people go about finding their options and and their need for advisors along the way so it's pretty amazing now obviously randy you've done a lot of changing since yes. you've built up a company and sold it correct so what do you what do you think about that idea of change or, uh, failure to change may be fatal well i, I think um, change is going to happen and you have to make a determination, are you going to grasp and learn through change, or are you going to let change change you? And the result is the result. So I think, um, and change makes makes people uncomfortable, but it definitely makes, it always, I'm more of an experience sharing type guy. The experiences make, make you better, and the bad ones even make you uh, a lot better. I heard uh, Tony Robbins just recently say, um, it it's, it's either happening to you or for you, right? And so I just well, I thought that was a... It's going to happen one way or the other. You yeah. might as well be uh, <laughs> on the front end of that trying to help make it happen. So, um, I mean, I think the capstone of the conversation today definitely needs to be Penny Strategies because that's what you're involved with now. Correct. But I think what's really compelling about Penny Strategies is how you even got to being involved with that. So can we kind of go back to uh, the company you founded with your brother, Texas Air Composites? Yes. And, uh, and how did you guys get going? What did that look like? Um, I uh, grew up in the aviation business. Okay. Uh, my parents started an aviation company in, in the garage of our house in December of 1973. Wow. So um, grew up with an entrepreneur, um, you know, saw the, the highs and lows of uh, what it's like to own your own business. Um, my father always told me if you like the lifestyle that he's provided for us and what we get to do, then, if you, then you need to be your own boss. So it was kind of instilled in me that that was the way I needed to go. Uh, it took me a little while to get there, but that's just the environment I came in. So um, yeah. I did work for my dad. Um, and what uh, kind of aviation was he involved he, in? Uh, pretty much the same type of business we did. He was a manufacturer of uh, composite and metal bonded type structures for the U.S. military. Okay. He did become an FAA repair facility in 1988. And um, so that was what we were. 
and that was kind of what we specialized in okay. repairing and overhauling composite parts for the commercial and regional airlines. So how did it, how did you go from working for your dad to splitting off with you and your brother starting your own? And was that not competition for him? Well, he had sold his company a few okay. times, and um, one of the times he sold it, uh, the group that came in and bought it, um, I acted half the time I acted like an owner's son, and half the time I didn't. And uh, and I just also kind of had an attitude with my dad. So my dad did me a favor. He politely fired me. (laughs) (laughs) So I I left there and I was telling him that I should should be running the company. He said, why don't you go help Boeing? uh, (laughs) That's where I went from uh, 97 to 2000. And that's the period of time where I did a lot of growing up, started going to church. I got some therapy and just really um, had to, you know, be, uh, had to make a decision. Was I going to be a victim? Or was I going to control my destiny? And that's kind of what led me to start a business plan. Okay. Uh, now, I'm sorry. I want to stop you there for a second. Sure. Uh, tell me a little more about that. How did you decide to stop being the victim? Because that, that's, a, that's a key hang-up that a lot of people have in a lot of ways, not just when they're starting businesses, but in personal lives. So tell me a little bit more about that real quick. Sure. I was uh, going to a therapist and just, you know, doing the old um, poor old me, 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 and blaming, her, blaming where I was in my life on everybody else. Hmm. And, the, and the person said, you have some points, but you've got to make a decision. Uh, you either got to forgive your father because one of these days he's going to pass away and you can't go make up with him when he's six feet under in a casket. So um, you just got to decide to keep going. So it wasn't only like anything got solved. I just had to take responsibility for where I was. And also working at a big company, you become a Social Security number. Hmm. And nobody really cares about, you know, working for your dad and the problems that you had, they always see that as that's an easy thing to do. So that's kind of what made me just have to take ownership and say, if I wanted to be happy and wanted, you know, um, a strong foundation, I had to be the owner of it. Interesting. I think that's a key takeaway because there's so many times that we're always blaming other people for our attitudes and, you know, like, why are you mad? Well, because so-and-so did this and that. Well, are you not in control of your own emotions and thoughts? And I mean, Anyway, I, I I love that. So anyway, thank so you, thank you. How did you and your brother end up starting a company then? Once you left Boeing, well, so um, I wanted to get back to Texas. Mm-hmm. I was in Seattle. Um, Boeing was a good company. Had you know the best resources at your fingertips from software to contacts. I mean, you go see an airline. You say you're from Boeing. You get the dinner with the vice president. So those, I, I learned a lot in, of uh, of how a big company works and the goodness of a big company. So I just kind of said, hey, I want to get back to Texas, and I want to be my own my own guy. Mm-hmm. How can I do it? Well, because of my dad's name and, and his connections through the years, the best way was to go back to Dallas and start a repair facility. Okay. So I had a mentor, a guy named Mike Burkett, and he just uh, he hooked me up with a guy named Tom Kane, and Tom helped me put a business plan together, which was kind of a, uh, unusual for me because I'm hyperactive. Uh, it's very hard for me to sit down, but that gave me a a uh, lesson on you because you always go and put their information in that you like best but anyway the business plan so i reached out to my brother and uh, said hey i want to come back to dallas i want to start a business he says i do too so that was kind of where we started and we had some other partners uh, guys who helped us as well and, and tom was the architect of the business plan and everybody else brought the information to the business plan so you and your brother must have been engineers no, um, I, I got a marketing degree. <laughs> oh, that's an obvious. But, but, I can, <laughs> but I can make a customer think I know how to fix the part. <laughs> and my brother, uh, he's kind of a, he's, he's a people person too. I was the door opener and he was the maintainer. He was very good. And once we get into the customer, he could, he could grow the account better than anybody could. And, uh, so you had some success and yeah. business is moving ahead? Yes. Um, uh, launched the business in 2000. Uh, Got a family friend that was in the aviation business uh, to uh, uh, initially put some money in. Then my dad said, "Looks like I has legs," so he loaned us some money. I moved. He made me move in at 36 years old. He made me move into the house. He said, "You're going to learn what it's like to be an entrepreneur. You're not going to get a salary." So for the first year and a half, I lived off eight credit cards. Wow! Oh. And so, um, so we just started the business. And uh, my brother came nine months after we started. He was already married and had kids, so we kind of wanted to get a little bit of traction before we picked up his salary. Mm-hmm. And we had other partners. At one time, there was probably about eight or nine of us and uh, shareholders. And um, we were top heavy from overhead because mm-hmm. we kind of gambled on, on you know, getting this count, a um, couple of airlines, and it just didn't work out. So 
by um, within a year, we're about about 100 grand in the hole, and we finally start making money in August of 2011. And September comes around, as you know, 9/11 hits. Oh wow! And we're devastated. And uh, but we finally start making money, and now the airlines aren't paying their bills because of this tragedy. And for and so fortunately, we were doing business with Southwest Airlines and Alaska were the few airlines that were paying in 30 days. Wow. But the SBA, uh, the government had an SBA disaster loan that allowed if you were doing business in the aviation, they would loan you money. Huh. That was our first loan. Very nice. So I imagine there's a lot of overhead in this business, isn't there? Because yeah. don't you have to rent a hangar in which to yeah. build oh, you these? Have to, you and... have to have a facility. You have to have the equipment. And you have to have the manuals before they'll give you a repair certificate. And the airlines won't come out and audit you unless you have a repair certificate. So there was a lot of upfront cash. I so, mean, I would say within the first year, we probably dumped about 450000 into the business. So a lot of money invested. Yes. You finally start getting some traction. Right. 9-11 hits. You get a loan. Now you're back on somewhat sounds like life support. Right. How do you get out? Um, um, so uh, things start clicking, and um, uh, we just kind of take off, and we – kind of made a niche for ourselves we were very good at going to the dumpster of the airlines and finding the parts that they were throwing away <laughs> so you go find a part that they're throwing away and you come up with a repair so now that fifteen hundred dollar brand new part cost them four hundred dollars wow and really you, and you sell it back to them yeah <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you pick up their trash and then fix it and sell it back to them yes i love it so that's kind of you know we became kind of the um the uh, backyard junkyard type guys, just the scrappers. And we were in the regional airline. That's kind of, we, we did f some commercial work for some of the big big guys, but we made our niche in the regional. The re We um, had a very uh, customer good service. And by going to them and treating the regional, it's like they were a commercial, give them a lot of attention, taking care of the problems, mm -hmm. not wanting the easy stuff. You know, and, and we also uh, repaired and overhauled toilets. A lot of people don't want to repair and overhaul toilets. That was somebody else's blank, <laughs> but that was our gravy train. Wow. So. <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that, <laughs> with that question. All right. So you're, you're taking off. You're, you're doing well. You're, you, I mean, it kind of blows up, doesn't yes, it? I mean, you're. Uh, 01, we went to 1.5. 02, we go to 3. 04, we're at 6. 05, you know, we're at 10. 10 million. Okay. So wow. we're, we're rocking and rolling. Um, and we've uh, kind of set, um, uh, the first year we were kind of lost and we really didn't have a strategy. And fortunately, I had uh, stumbled back into a book called The Stake in the Outcome. And that book, I was reminded that I'd read The Great Game of Business in the mid-90s and always said that if I ever had a business, I would uh, put those type of principles into my business. Well, The Stake in the Outcome really talks about partnership, having an ownership culture, putting the company first beside yourself. So it's all about we before me. A lot of entrepreneurs work very hard, and they take a lot of um, uh, risk, and, um, but they don't, they sometimes start putting themselves in front of the company. So you always have to put the company because you really make your money when you sell the company. So we're going to go to break. When we get back, we're going to talk more about putting the company before yourself. Stick around. And now, Confessions of a Recovering Landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease, because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases, while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. Don't let landlords have all the power. As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? Hi, I'm Stephen Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy? 
one that you can articulate, or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. This is Roger Shake and Steve Walks from Legacy Consulting Group, and we declined our invitation to the Jimmy Kimmel Show to spend time with Bob and Steven. Welcome back to the next level, Conversations That pro- Propels Business. We're here with our guest, Randy Haran, and he's the former president and CEO of Texas Air Composites and the current owner and founder of Penny Strategies. You can f- learn more th- about him at pennystrategies.com. So, Randy, I you know, teased it right before, but, I mean, there, there's a big part of your story is the – putting the company before yourself. Right. So I'd like to dial, dial into that a little bit more because I think you've got some really powerful experience to share. Yeah, so it's we before me, and that's what I learned from the Jack Stack book, Staking the Outcome. So I had some partners, and we all weren't on the same page on what type of culture and vision we had for the company. And they wanted to put themselves before the company, mm-hmm. and which um, caused us to have a breakup. And in 07, when they tried to take the company over, I was able, my brother and I were able to uh, push them out through litigation and we were able to get control of the company. Wow. And after that, we had everybody on the same page that uh, we were going to build the company up. We're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to make market salary. We're in the times, times that are good. We will mm-hmm. share the money, not only with ourselves, but to our employees. But that's where we were focused. And that's kind of where the great game came into play that um, it's had some very good points where you're all about future the great game really drives you to focus on the future it's all about forward forecasting so real quick high level for those that don't know or have never heard of the great game well how would you i mean quickly summarize it so they can kind of track with what the great game is all about uh taking business and from a game perspective you got to know and teach the rules you got to follow the action and keep score you got to have a stake in the outcome and those three principles are all centered over one over a number called the critical number what's that one thing that keeps you up as an entrepreneur that you, if it doesn't get taken care of, it has a long-term negativity towards your business. And what was that in Texas Air Composites? We always, uh, the main one we focused for was profit before tax. So it's, you know, it's the EBITDA number, but the thing, the subcritical numbers that drove that, most of our uh, workforce was in the gross margin. So gross margin was the main thing that drove down to our profit before tax. And so it's basically an open book style philosophy management of running your business. Right. And then so you implemented this uh-huh. after you've gone through and it, you kind of glossed over it. But I mean, I can't imagine having to use litigation as a way to get a partner out. I mean, there has to probably be a little bit of stress involved with that. Uh, yes. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, my father, who was my mentor, had passed away in August of 07. Oh my gosh. He'd come to work for us in 2001. Um, and then I got diagnosed with cancer in September of 07, and then in October is when they tried to do the hostile takeover. Oh, my. What a year. Yes. So by the end of the year, um, you know, we had control of the company, and that's kind of when we started putting our philosophy into play. So what, what happened when once those guys were out of the business and it was back to you and your brother— what, where, what happened to the company after that? And you implemented the great game. Right. So th- how did that turn out? Well, um, it turned out very well. In fact, where the great game really came into play, where you really know if it's working or not, was when you have hard times. And in 2010, we had a very hard year. We uh, had a bad customer. We had a bad product line. We just moved into a new facility. Uh, we just kind of weren't playing the game uh, uh, seriously as enough. And that year, we lost almost over a million dollars. So at the end, we were about $150,000 short of getting cash positive. Mm -hmm. And I went to the workforce and said, we're going to have to uh, uh, decrease salaries. And one of the individuals said, hey, Randy, instead of us taking a hit, can we pick some expenses and go after those expenses and find the savings there? I said, absolutely. He goes, we can't get something going in 30 days. Uh, We'll all take a pay cut. Well, then 30 days that we started seeing some movement, Mm -hmm. And they were able to cover what the pay cut could have given the business. And within a year, we were able to save $380,000. Wow. By focusing on expenses. And and it it wasn't me in those meetings. It was my managers and the frontline people going over every week what the variables were. And what you know, what we need to do to cut those expenses. Now I love that because this was sort of bottom up. Yes. Pushing you as the owner. Yes. How? What empowered them 
to think they could do that. Well, they had something in it because if you take a 5 or 10% pay cut, yeah. they're actually putting money into it. So for them to keep their salary where it was, they you know had to had to change the score. But even, even at that, though, something there, there had to have been a culture in the business to mm-hmm. some extent that sort of made these people say, yeah, you're the owner, but guess what? I have a better idea. Right. And, I mean, most companies, I don't hear that kind of attitude among the, the employees. Well, one thing about an entrepreneur, you find out fairly quickly uh, that you don't know everything. And the quicker you get to that point and spread the uh, opportunity around to other people and get their input, the quicker you're going to rise to, you know, better, uh, better business results. So where's that company today? Uh, we sold that company in 2014. Uh, after 2010, 2011, we took off. And uh, we wanted to get our EBITDA close to $5 million to get a, a, a nice multiple. And we were able to do that in 2014. And uh, we sold it. And... Um, so 2010, you lose a million bucks. 2014, you have $5 million in EBITDA and sell it for a great multiple and cash out. Yes, sir. Outstanding. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you very much. So then what? Um, so we sell, and I was kind of trying to figure out a way to work myself out. I'd signed a two-year employment agreement. Within 60 or 90 days, they kind of put me in a corner of the of a room. and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Made you sit in the corner? Yeah, I made you sit in the corner with my face <laughs> to the corner. And, uh, you know, they owned the company. There was no reason for me to be in. I didn't have an earn out, so everything was taken. And um, so I kind of just kind of transitioned out and just kind of was uh, kind of figuring out what I was going to do and where I was going. I did a lot of celebrating, and um, that's where I kind of wanted to get back into the great game. Uh, what's That's my passion is helping entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and talking about my experiences and using the great game to help them build a foundation you know, for a good exit when that time comes. And so that's what Penny Strategies does now? Yes. So you guys are helping companies implement basically the the, the secret sauce, if you will, of what you did with your company. Yes, very. that is correct, Steve. That's awesome. So uh, Penny Strategies, when I first heard the name, I thought, you know, penny stocks. Somehow you, the, I was going to hear about, you know, some great way to invest using penny stock strategies, but that's not it at all, obviously, since it's about all about implementing the great game of business and the companies, but where did the name come from? Well, when I was 19, Bob, um, I, I knew everything. I was just a <laughs> freshman year out of college. Didn't we all? <laughs> and, uh, and I was placed class president in my fraternity, so I was the, the guy. And uh, anyway, we went up to go buy some burgers, my dad and I, and some fries for the family at Wendy's. And it was $19.96, and my dad gave me a 20. And I gave the lady 20, she gave me four pennies. Well, I was 19. I'm too good for four pennies. So I threw the four pennies down the ground. So my dad made me pull over, pull to the side. He got out of the car, went back over to the drive through picked up the pennies, got back in the car, and was just really was very intense on his feelings that I <laughs> had disrespected money. Uh-huh. And he said, if you know, he didn't care how wealthy he was, he was never too good for a penny. Hmm. And it had such a, um, a um, uh, influence on me at that time. From that point on, I always pick up any any pennies, nickels, quarters, wherever they are. And you name a company after that yes. penny. Very cool. Thank you. I like that a lot. So I mentioned in the beginning, um, we, we met through Entrepreneurs Organization. Randy yes. and I served on the board together. He, he, I mean, like I said, paying it forward, he was in charge of mentorship last year and helping people get mentorship within the organization. Um, I, just, I mean, what was the experience along this? We didn't talk much about it, but what was the impact of EO for you through the through all those times um eo uh, really helped me out because it um made me f- realize that i wasn't a guy i wasn't a person on the island there were other people having the same challenges through eo i had my form group in that form group was the attorney that came to help me during that hostile takeover oh my gosh my attorney my regular attorney had resigned knowing that that was going to happen mm-hmm. so her name's michelle roberts so michelle had come so i'd gotten Michelle, also my business advisor that was kind of advising me during this time and helping me through this, I met him through EO. Wow. So I would meet other attorneys and, uh, you know, accounting and just if the, um, my story through how the EO web really was a game changer. I mean, I don't think I, we, I would have been successful without EO. That's outstanding. So whenever a company comes to you and says, yeah, I'd, I'd like you to implement the great game of business in my company. Where do you start? Well, I, I start with the entrepreneur, and I said, I said, when you first think about opening up your books, it's going to make you nervous because you're getting ready to have to explain um, where the numbers are coming from. And I said, so before we jump into that, 
let's kind of talk about what your goal is, Mr. and Ms. Entrepreneur. And I say, I first put a plan in place that's going to help every year for you to build value. Because when you exit, that's going to be the biggest day of your life. And you don't necessarily want to work again. You want to have that luxury and that choice. So that's kind of where I start with them is working on building the foundation. And Great Game has tools that help you very uh, well on building that foundation that kind of align with the principles of an M&A firm would want to do to your business to get more value when you get sold. So what's their greatest, re- I mean, I'm, <clears throat> just even personally, I'm sitting here listening, you know, um, full opening, you know, kimono of all the numbers and everything like that. I mean, I imagine you got to have a lot of pushback on that. Is that hard to sell? I mean, in regards to trying to get an entrepreneur to buy into doing that? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, of, uh, fear on that. Mm-hmm. And you, you just, um, I mean, when you say open up the books, you open up the books, you know, to a point where you can get your, um, workforce centered around those numbers okay. and how they affect those numbers and then they get a stake in the outcome so so, does, so the entrepreneur is not saying hey here's my here's my salary or anything like that yeah. you know there's there's imp- numbers and you know sometimes you still have your um your like i, I call it below the line mm-hmm. where you know you don't want to pay a lot of taxes so you might take you know distributions and that type and i you know i don't share that information with them it's none of their business on what people make personally right but they they know enough that uh, what the numbers are, and they have a piece in that if we perform and do what we're supposed so to. So sort of high level P and L, but yep. not showing you know exactly what everybody's salaries are, right. and you know exactly how much everything else is costing. Right. Okay. Interesting. You know, we we've had some people on the on the show before that have been a part of Great Game, and and they talked about this as well. One guy went to an extreme, Matt Monero at uh, Commercial Fleet Finance, and and I mean they they not only shared all the numbers with their employees, but they also did that with clients Mm -hmm. and, and they had what they called a scrum meeting every, every day they'd have a meeting and they would videotape it and post it on their YouTube channel for everybody to see. And they would talk about clients and everything going on in the company. Does, is that part of great game to share it with clients as well? Uh, some do. I mean, uh, depending on the clients and to share the information I've, I've heard of other practitioners, you know, that do that. So, Randy, what's next? I mean, what, 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 what's, what are you looking forward to next? Um, I'm, in, I'm presently getting ready to come out and start speaking about my experiences mm-hmm. uh, through that. So, through that, um, I'm hoping that um, through those my experiences, it can help entrepreneurs. And they can either talk to me about their challenges. And if they're interested in opening up the great game, um, we would do some coaching with them. Uh, they can go to workshops and that type of stuff. It's just to um, uh, work with the entrepreneur and t- see how I can help he or she and uh, kind of guide them so that so they're prepared for that wealth creating moment. Sounds like there'll be a book coming. Stay tuned. Well, thanks so much for being our guest today, <laughs> Randy. You. We really Thank appreciate you, it. Please go to pennystrategies.com to learn more. If you want to learn more about the shows, please go to nextlevelshow.com. Help spread the word. See you next week. Have a great week. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.